Let's first start with a review of the last lecture where we looked at the ROC curve and we started looking at the K nearest uh, neighbors algorithm. Uh, we'll continue with that. Uh, and then I'll talk a little bit about what are parametric versus non-parametric models. And then uh, we'll look at some examples uh, of traditional algorithms, such as what we've already been looking at as decision trees and random forests. Um, so we'll continue on and we look at logistic regression, which is also a classification uh, algorithm and SVM support vector machines, which is also a classification algorithm and a clustering algorithm uh, will also be taken a look at. So these, we look at these uh, fairly briefly without going into too much technical discussion. So um, <clears throat> last time we spoke about the ROC curve and we looked at it in quite a lot of detail, uh, the re receiver operating characteristics curve, and we looked at how it operates. And we also compared different algorithms and saw that if you compare the area under the curve of different algorithms, then you can get a good idea as to which algorithm is actually better or which is worse. And if you looked at individual operating points uh, based on individual decision thresholds, you can th then decide between each one of these whether uh, one of these is actually better than the other. Okay, so this was on the left, a comparison of individual operating points. And on the right, this was a comparison of complete algorithms, okay? But both of these can be used to determine uh, different uh, objectives. Uh, and then we started talking about uh, one of the non-ANN um, machine learning algorithms, which was uh, K-nearest neighbors. Uh, let's just take a quick look at that. Uh, we looked at, we started by saying, um, what if we have the traditional classification issue. Uh, you have two features being shown over here and you have uh, some points which have already been labeled uh, through a machine, through a supervising method. And you're trying to figure out where a new point should be placed, whether it should be categorized uh, in, let's say this category or in this category. And uh, we looked at the KNN classification algorithm which basically said that uh, we will start with, let's say k is equal to one, and we will figure out which is the nearest neighbor. Um, and if the nearest neighbor happens to be um, of category type whatever, we will use the same category to classify the new unknown um, item. And if we have a larger value of k, for example, three or five, then we, in the case of three, we will look at the three nearest neighbors, as in this case, you're looking at this point, this point, and this point, or if you're looking at k is equal to five, we would look at even additional points. And then based on the majority vote, we will decide what category to classify uh, the new item Y1N, okay? But we saw that uh, there were some issues with it as well, for example, when uh, in this particular example, uh, we can see that X seems to be uh, to be in the one category. If you say this is the one category and this is the zero category, but it seems to be class, uh, classified incorrectly by the KNN algorithm. So it doesn't always uh, work perfectly. Um, and uh, then the issue was, how do we actually determine the optimal value of K? So one of the techniques that we talked about last time is that what you could do is break up your data set into let's say training data and test data and use uh, different values of K in the testing portion to be able to see how accurately it is uh, those uh, test data are determined. And that could be used perhaps to be able to figure out what is the optimal value of K. And then we stopped uh, at the discussion point as to what happens if K is too small or too large. And I threw this uh, diagram at you to give you an idea as to what could be a possible problem when K is very small, for example, K is equal to one. So here's a case where you're trying to classify rectangles, which you can see over here, and triangles. And why, um, 
is over here. And my question to you to make this a little bit interactive is that um, what could be a possible problem if, if you use k is equal to one? Can somebody comment on that? Sure, what is k? So k, if I re, re, uh, remind you, is k is the number of neighbors that you're looking at. Okay, so if k is equal to um, one, as in this case, um, k is equal to one, then we're only looking at the nearest neighbor, right? And if k is equal to three, then we're looking at the three nearest neighbors. Okay, so I hope that that is clear. Okay, so if you're trying to classify y as either triangles or rectangles, when k is equal to one, we're basically saying that we're only looking at the nearest neighbor. We're not looking at three neighbors, we're not looking at five neighbors, we're only looking at one neighbor. Okay. So, this way, we are losing out on other neighbors as well. Like, if we look at neighbor, we can look at Yeah. So, uh, that's absolutely right. So, um, if you make k is equal to 1, which is very small, then basically uh, what we, and you can see over here that which is, which is going to be the nearest neighbor to y in this case? Is it going to be a rectangle or a triangle? Rectangle. 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 Yeah, so clearly the, the, the nearest neighbor is actually a rectangle. But do you think why should, if you look at the big picture, do you think why is more closer to the triangles or to the rectangles? Sir, it actually is more closer to triangles. But yeah. the closest one is the rectangle. Yeah, so that's the basic problem. When k is too small, then basically what you could have is an outlier. You can see that this particular rectangle is sort of an outlier. Most of the rectangles are over here, right? But I've especially drawn this as an outlier and I've made it very close to y because you can have outliers as well. And most of the triangles, so y seems to be mostly close to the triangles, but because one of the outliers has become very close to y, when, you, when you're when you just looking at k is equal to one, and we're only looking at the nearest neighbor, then y is going to be misclassified as a rectangle, okay? So I hope that point is, is clear that if k is too small, it may be subject to the effect of outliers, okay, as in this case. And you can think of other examples where uh, this could be a problem. Now, the other question is, what if k is too large? So um, think of an example where uh, k, if k is too large, what could be a possible problem? So in this case, if you make k too large, what do you think is going to happen? So k could be, let's say, extremely large. K is large enough to have all of these neighbors looked at. Is that is that better than k is too small, or is that still problematic? Now, let's say k is, for example, the other extreme, k is equal to infinity, right? So we're looking at all the possible neighbors, and we, if you have a thousand da data points, we're looking at all the thousand uh, data points. Is that good or is that bad? Sir, it would be bad again. Because, I mean, we cover the outliers in my mind, like we are covering now. Right. So the outliers will still be covered. But, um, uh, but you see, in this particular case, let's see, you've got how many triangles? One, two, three, four, five, six triangles, right? And you've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven rectangles, right? Now, if you go k is equal to infinity, uh, what is y going to be classified as? Rectangle. It's going to be classified as a rectangle because rectangles are in the majority and triangles are in the minority. So, can somebody tell me what? See, how how can you how can you comment on the problem? What is the basic problem here? And you make k too large. Sir, it will be classified as the majority. Exactly, exactly. So if so, if you make k is equal to too large, regardless of, you know, the classification is not going to be very, very simple. Very, it's going to be a very trivial classification. It's simply going to say, well, whichever, uh, which whichever item is in the majority, you're going to be classified as that. 
And even though, uh, you know, so for example, if you look at the next uh, example over here, you can see that triangles, there are only three triangles, right? But Y2 is clearly at, in the triangles camp. And if you try to classify, here's one big cluster and here's another cluster. But if, for example, you make K is equal to, let's say, anything greater than three, if you make, well, if you make it five, it'll still probably be, um, it'll still probably come out over here somewhere. And, but if you make K is equal to seven, what's going to happen? So rectangle will classify over. Yeah, also. if you make K is equal to five, what is it going to be classified as? Then triangles. Triangles, so this is going to be okay. But as soon as you cross this point, and you go to k is equal to seven, which means that you've actually, now the number of triangles is, there were only three triangles. So now as soon as you've gone to k is equal to seven, and as you can see in the next slide, um, with k is equal to seven, you've now got one, two, three, four uh, rectangles and three triangles. So again, basically the point here is that category with few samples will always be outvoted by other categories. So if you've only got three categories over here, if you've only got three items, with only three samples over here, even though Y2 is right smack in the middle of the triangles, it's always going to be outvoted by uh, others which are perhaps in larger numbers, okay? So uh, this is sort of uh, some of the issues with making K is equal to too small and K is equal to too large that you've got problems Sir? on both sides, yeah. So how? Line can I draw the optimal k value? Kya honi right, right. So, so that's the basic issue that how, how do you, but uh, did I give you a hint about that? What did we just say? How would you actually figure out? Well, let's just think again. If you, if you have no idea what it looks like, right? You don't have a visual representation of triangles and rectangles. You don't know how many triangles there are, how many rectangles there are. You're simply trying to figure out where should y be. So what did we just discuss? What would be a good way to be able to classify, to be able to figure out what how many, what should be the value of K? Sir, maybe we can find the average distance between the neighbors, neighbors and the Y. Or okay. sir, some, huh, yeah. sorry, sir. Yeah, keep going. Sir, this can also be able to say that we know so much that my, like subsum minimum number of sheep the second two shapes of classify kar rahe to right. hamare paas minimum number kya hai hum minimum se plus 2 ya plus 1 karke somehow ek nikal sakte hain but but you see you don't really know what you know right now you have a visual representation you can see that y is in the triangle camp right but what if you don't have that visual representation it's a very complex problem let's say and um, if you make K is equal, as you changing K, uh, the, the classification of Y is changing. So um, think again, how would you do it? I mean, I heard some good ideas as well, but I'd like to hear them again. Sir, I was talking about the average distance. Okay, so let's, let's uh, build up on that idea. How would you use the average distance to be able to figure out um, what where should y be categorized so basically what you're saying is let's uh, look at the distance to um to these okay and let's compare that with the distance to these other guys yes okay that's an excellent idea so if you sort of looked at the distance and you 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 try to classify it in the category which was closer to it Okay, so, so you've hit on a great idea, but it will not be considered as a KNN algorithm because in KNN, you're basically saying, I'm going to look at the K nearest neighbors. Okay, K nearest neighbors. So when you're only looking at the K nearest neighbors, um, you're not looking at the distance. Okay, because we'll cover that, but it'll be a different algorithm. All right, it's a great idea, but it won't be a KNN algorithm, it'll be a different algorithm and we'll talk about that shortly, okay? But let's just think about within KNN, if you, if you just want to use the KNN algorithm, which is simply saying, I'm going to look at the, at the K nearest neighbors, 
then uh, continue thinking uh, how else could you use, could you determine the value of K? Now, we, we're not really saying how it's going to be classified, but we're saying what should be a good value of K? Sir, we have to say that the total number of uh, objects is the total number of total objects. Is the Ha, so you yes, you would know that because remember, if you're trying to find out the k nearest neighbors, then um, you would have to actually find out the distance between every neighbor as well. Okay, that's how you'd actually figure out which is the first, the, the nearest neighbor, and and the second nearest and the third nearest. So if you're using k is equal to three, you'd actually have to find the distance with between all neighbors. Okay and then figure out which are the nearest three neighbors and then figure out, okay, if these, if the nearest neighbor uh, is this one, this is in uh, category green, okay, it's a triangle. If you're looking at the next three neighbors, then you figure out that, well, the first one is, is a triangle, but the other two are, are squares. So then you're going to be, majority will be squares and, and so on. So you will have to look at all the neighbors. So it is, if you think about the algorithm, it's quite uh, intensive in terms of uh, calculations, okay? But, but since you are um, calculating all the distances, the thought that uh, was earlier expressed is not so bad, that you actually think about the distances involved and you, and you try to separate maybe the closer ones versus the, the greater ones. But again, that becomes part of a slightly different algorithm. So we'll discuss that later. But I, I gave you a hint. Actually, I, I gave you an idea about how to discuss uh, to determine K just a little while ago, but I think people have missed it. Sir, what if K over two? K, K upon two. What do you mean by K upon two? Oh, sorry, K over two. Kar. Like total value, we uska half. Kar de. Malab, total okay. number of objects, which is the half, hoga, wo K ki value. Kar de. Okay, will that solve this problem? So in other but words, I think it will solve it. Sir, it will not solve it. Yeah, it will not solve it because you see, you have three triangles over here, and here, let's say you have ten rectangles. So that would be thirteen divided by two would be six or seven. But let's say this was hundred over here. Okay, so the number would clearly be somewhere around fifty or so, and these triangles would clearly become outvoted. Okay, so you can't just take the total number of items and divide it by two. Okay, number of items divided by two is not working out either. Okay. Or sorry, kya ye, balke ye, ek aur idea hai, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Hum log, uh, ye jo, uh, sir, rectangles hai, inko bhi divide by two kare or triangles ko bhi. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. All right, so keep the, keep going. Then what do we do? So let's see. We've already a we, problem if it if if rectangles are hundred and triangles are three. Okay, so we've already got classification that we know that there are uh, we've we've done supervision. We've got we know that there are three in one category and a hundred in the other, right? And now we're trying to figure out where should y be. Okay. And what should be the optimal value of K? So your suggestions, so repeat that again. How, how would you try to solve this? Um, Sir, so, can we have a general square, uh, square principle, like a square root of the number of points that we... Uh, Yes, you, you could try that, but again, that will not always work. Now, I gave you a fantastic idea, but all of you seem to have missed it, okay? Think about training versus testing. So training. Sir, could, is it possible to iteratively like increase the values of K and then find out the numbers for each value? Like you find out for K equals to one, how many numbers do you have and for K equals to two? Okay, so let's try that out. So suppose you say that uh, you try the number of iterations uh, or you try different values of K, okay? So you go from K is equal to 
a one to three to five to seven to nine and so on, right? And when you have k is equal to one, it's going to be a triangle, okay? Uh, triangle again, triangle again. Um, let me delete this. Sir, is in the flaw, we are gonna is stopping criteria. Jo hai amara, wo ye ban jaya ke jab repeat hona start ho jaye, ek particular shape ke output jaye ke bhi ye rectangle hoga. Lekin sir, uske andar wohi wala masla aega ke jab wohi k equals to infinity wali baat a jayegi, jo zada hoga usko ye show kar dega ya wala ya wali tis ko. But but you could you could use. Uh, I'm just thinking out loud. Uh, you can see and and of course. Uh, you can always come up with a new algorithm. You know, that's how research is done. So here, um, somebody just suggested that you start with k small and you keep increasing it and you see at some point you're going to switch, okay? So in this case, you saw that initially it was all triangles and then it became all rectangles. So perhaps this is not such a bad algorithm and I'm just thinking out loud right now is that uh, when you see that initially it is of is in one group and then it's switching to another group, maybe that could be used as a point to decide uh, that um, uh, K, this is the maximum that you want to go because now it's switching to another. But let's say if it was switching differently, suppose that it was now not uh, completely this case, but it was um, something like this. Okay. Then, is it very clear where to stop? No, so then you'd have a problem. Then you have a problem, right? But if you if it was all rectangles afterwards, then is it is it clearer? Yeah, yes, yeah. So it, it would. So here we, we've come up with a new algorithm and maybe you can write a paper on it and publish it. You know, that's what uh, PhD students do. They come up, they think about these ideas. And here basically what we're saying is that if there is a consistency on, on the two sides, initially it was all triangles and then it became all rectangles. Then we could come up with a new algorithm. We could say, you know, you give it your name and this could be a good, good idea. And it would only work if you, your, the second category is not switching. But if you see that it is continuously switching, then you don't have a solution and you back to square one and you need to now find a better algorithm. Okay. Okay, so now I want to go back to my idea, which I've been trying to throw at you for a while. Um, can you use the concept of training and testing? Okay, remember this is a supervised algorithm. You've already classified your triangles and your rectangles. And the only thing that you're trying to figure out is a new chap. Okay, and the main question is, what is a good value of K? So I'm assuming that none of you got the point earlier made, but think about training versus testing. Um, remember, we, we did this issue of overfitting as well, and we saw that the losses were going lower with training. And when you were testing it, it would sort of go up, and this would be used, could be used to, to stop overfitting. Can this idea be used over here? It's a different it's a different question. You're trying to determine K. You're not trying to determine overfitting. But um, can this idea be used over here? So let's say that we have 100 points, which includes three over here. So let's say 103 points total. OK, 103 samples. And what? Uh, we, well, this is not a very good number. Let's say we had 30 over here and 100 over here. Okay, so we had 130 total. Um, of these 130, we said that we will randomly choose 100 of them for training, for test uh, training, and then we will use 30 for testing. Okay, now, um, now, now take this idea forward. Can we use this idea to determine what should be K? Okay, I'm so going to give you further hints. Yeah. Iskinder, just we did this. Overfitting, if it diverges, we stop it. 
तो ये right. क्या करेंगे सो थिंक सो सो लेट्स से दैट ऑफ द हंड्रेड ट्रेनिंग केसेस वीव इन द हंड्रेड केसेस वीव ऑलरेडी यूज दीज एंड नाउ वॉट वी डू इज uh we use 30 randomly we forget forget about these for a while we use 30 random points and we see whether and we already know their classifications okay so now we not going to class we not going to look at y2 we not going to look at a new point okay what we going to do so this is important we going to randomly select 30 of these so let's say we selected one of these this is the first one that we selected now we apply k is equal to 1 on this what will we get we will probably get it a rectangle right then uh, we apply k is equal to 3 on it we keep on increasing it and we find out whether uh, what's a good value of k for this so eventually uh, well in this case um, as you go to larger and larger k values is all this going to be considered to be a rectangle so that's not a good suggestion let's say we come to this guy now this we already have to supervised uh learning we already know that this is a triangle right is that right we already know this guy to be a triangle now suppose that's we start right. now suppose we start with k is equal to 1 and we try to classify it what is it going to be is going to come out as a triangle then we use k is equal to 3 uh what is it going to be classified as again a triangle right now we go to k is equal to 5 what is it going to be classified as triangle 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 1 2 3 4 5 no it's actually going to be classified as a rectangle because it's not including itself and this guy we not including this so when you looking at this equals to 5 mein triangle hi aayega na do matlab we looking at five nearest five nearest neighbors only two of yes, these sir. will be triangles and the other three will be rectangles acha aapne ek exclude kar diya ha because that, that i'm looking at this chap now remember what we doing we are taking a random randomly okay. random case whose classification we know and now we going to test it to see what value of k is good for it what value of k does it correctly classify okay so let me draw it over here um so we looking at this chap over here okay and we going to look at different values of k and classification so k is equal to 1 is going to be triangle k is equal to 3 is going to be a triangle k is equal to 5 is going to become a rectangle now what's the label in this case label is a triangle because we've already we already know what the label is 7 it becomes a rectangle so is this correct this is correct this is correct uh this is wrong these two are not matching it's being classified as a rectangle whereas in fact it's a triangle Uh, again as you go to larger and larger values in all of these cases we find out that it is getting misclassified so are you are you getting what we doing okay so based on this experiment we determine that the uh, the a good value of k is maximum is 3 as soon as we go beyond 3 this triangle is getting misclassified okay uh, but sir is not uh, won't we have the same problem that you were having in the iterative method ke hamare paas agar sirf triangles hi ho pure usme data set ke andar to it will keep on increasing yeah so i'm not sure if i get your question say that again uh, sir if we only have triangles in our data set to if you only on increasing if we okay so if you only have if the majority of them you mean for example the majority of them are rectangles is is that what you're saying okay so if the majority of them are rectangles and then we we look at this particular case so yes it won't be an optimal solution i can see what your point is 
that for all the rectangles, a large value of k. So if you look at a rectangle case, so now let's take a look at a rectangle case. I'm going to erase all of this. And let's take a look at a rectangle case and see what happens over there. So for k uh, classification and the label, the label we know in this case is a rectangle. So we've taken this particular rectangle and now we're going with one, three, five, seven, nine, eleven, and so on. So in all of these cases, it's going to be classified as a rectangle. Okay. So here, basically, what we're saying is that uh, regardless of the value of k, in all of these cases, it's going to be correctly classified. In all of these, it's going to be correctly classified, right? Because rectangles are in the majority. But if we if we looked at one of the triangles, then for the triangles, we can see that the maximum, the optimal value of k is less than three. So now you will be you'll be uh, so you'll have the, the k value. sorry. The value for the k uh, can be different for both triangle and the rectangle. Yeah. So so basically, we're looking at thirty test cases, and we're trying to and based on those thirty cases, we're trying to determine which is the a good value of k. Okay. Now, if from those thirty, if if twenty seven of them are rectangles. Uh, for them, k could be any number. Okay, k could be between zero to infinity. They're all good. But for uh, this, for the rectangles, but for the three triangles, when we looked at them, we will find out that actually k value between one and three is okay, but anything beyond that is a problem. Okay. So this would be our result if we looked at this particular example. So based on this, we would come to the conclusion that, well, here it doesn't really matter, but here it does matter. So if you want to get a good result, then we should focus on the constraint. The constraint here is that it should be less than three. Here there is no constraint. It could be any number and we always get the right answer. Okay. Sir? Yeah. Uh, sir, I discussed the method discuss a little bit of observation. Can you tell me if it's okay or not? सर अगर जैसे आपने अभी बताया और अभी हम हम लोग इस कंक्लुजन पे आ रहे हैं कि थ्री से कम होगी ऑप्टिमल वैल्यू तो सर ऐसा नहीं अगर हम हम ये बात तो जानते हैं कि हमारे पास नंबर ऑफ रेक्टेंगल्स और नंबर ऑफ ट्राइंगल्स कितने हैं ठीक है तो हम हमेशा अगर जो मिनिमम नंबर ऑफ शेप है सिर्फ जैसे अगर मेरे पास यहाँ पे ट्राइंगल थ्री है अगर मैं अपनी के की वैल्यू थ्री रखूं और उसकी बेसिस पे जो मेरे पास जो भी आउटपुट आ रहा है वो मेरे पास ट्रू ही आएगा अगर रेक्टेंगल आएगा तो इसका मतलब है कि क्लोजेस्ट रेक्टेंगल ही है और अगर ट्राइंगल आएगा तो इसका मतलब है क्लोजेस्ट ट्राइंगल ही है तो हमारे यहाँ जो सोल्यूशन है वो इस पे बेस्ट नहीं होना चाहिए कि जो मिनिमम नंबर ऑफ शेप्स है बस हम वो वैल्यू के को असाइन कर दें I'm not saying it's a bad suggestion. So it's a good suggestion, but um, we sort of tweaking an algorithm based on a particular hypo, hy, hy, particular scenario, right? Now, what if the scenario wasn't like this? What if the scenario was somewhat evenly balanced? So would would your suggestion sir, now work, work. still work over here? It, yeah, sir, it would work like here. Yeah, six triangles are my pass. और मैं अगर सिक्स अपने पास के की वैल्यू ऑप्टिमल ऑप्टिमली असाइन करता हूं तो आप यहां पे देख सकते हैं कि वी वुड गेट ट्रायंगल एज एन मतलब व्हाई वुड बी अ ट्रायंगल क्योंकि सिक्स ऑप्टिमल मिनिमम वैल्यू है ट्रायंगल्स की और क्लोजेस भी ट्रायंगल्स हैं और अगर आप इसी सिनेरियो को थोड़ा रिवर्स कर दें रेक्टेंगल्स को आगे कर दें क्लोज कर दें और ट्रायंगल्स को थोड़ा फार पुट कर दें तो आप आपको रेक्टेंगल आंसर मिलेगा तो हमारा जो कंसर्न होना चाहिए उससे मिनिमम वैल्यू ऑफ जो एक शेप है वो वो कितनी है उतनी होनी चाहिए मेरे ख्याल सो दीज आर गुड सजेशंस दीज आर गुड सजेशंस अम द क्वेश्चन इज अम हाउ अम हाउ गुड वुड दीस जनरलाइज एंड आई गेट योर पॉइंट दैट इन दिस इन द सिनेरियोस दैट वी लुकिंग एट दे सीम टू बी वर्किंग ओके एंड दैट्स व्हाई इट्स ऑलवेज गुड टू कम अप विद न्यू आइडियाज एंड सजेशंस um 
and you could actually try to work it out. You know, maybe in uh, when you get a chance and to do some research, you could actually take a look at this algorithm and see whether you can come up with a modification of the KNN where K is simply chosen to be based on the uh, class, the category, which is the smaller of the two, if it's a binary classification. Okay. So very good. This is what I want you guys to do is to think about the problem in a general way and say, well, is the algorithm that we're studying, is that the best algorithm or can we come up with a better algorithm? But then when you're looking at an algorithm, you have to look at a variety of things. What other things do you need to look at? Um, remember that, that in, in the whole course, when we studied algorithms, what were the kinds of issues that we looked at when, you, when you're considering uh, whether an algorithm is good or bad? Complexity. Complexity, exactly, exactly. And generalization as well, okay? So if you come up with new uh, scenarios, does it generalize, does it give, still give you, uh, or is it very specific to a particular scenario that you have in mind, okay? And complexity is of course extremely important. So you'd have to look at all of those and maybe you, uh, KNN is, is obviously not uh, the best optimal algorithm in this case, but it's just one algorithm which is popular and that's why we're studying it, okay? So, um, right. So now let's take a look at uh, some other exam, some other models. And uh, before we go to the other models, uh, I want to discuss another concept, which is the concept of a parametric versus non-parametric models, okay? Now, what do we mean by that? Uh, parametric models are those where the number of parameters is fixed and independent of the size of the data set. Okay. Now, remember, what do we mean by the number of parameters? Remember that when we looked at the CNN algorithm, um, what were the number of parameters? You did this in your, in your quiz just recently, so you should be able to remember that. Right. In the CNN algorithm, the number of parameters N was equal to, does anybody remember? Yes, sir, number of filters multiplied. Yeah, so if the number of filters are k, for example, um, k times the size of the filters, um, times times the depth. depth, times the depth, right? So that was the basic number of parameters. And if you want to be more precise, it was actually plus k as well. Okay, but this is a small number, as some of you pointed out. So even if you don't, didn't give this, or if you gave this, the answer would be correct. So um, is the number of parameters fixed and is independent of size in a CNN? Or is it, or does it depend on the size of the data set? It does not depend on the size of the data set. It exactly, the the exactly. So if your, if your input image was W1 by W1, the number of parameters was independent of that, right? It doesn't depend on W1. So in this case, would it be considered as a, as a parametric model or a non-parametric? Non-parametric is one where it assumes that N can grow with the data set. So, so a neural network would be parametric or non-parametric? Uh, uh, non-parametric? In non-parametric, N can grow with the data size. In so parametric, parametric, so it's going to be parametric, right? Why? Because the number of parameters is fixed. Now, who determines the number of parameters in a neural network? Who determines this? Sorry? In a neural network, if, if we have more inputs, then we have more outputs. Yes, but is the number of parameters depends on the input and output? No, sir, the user no. says. No. The number of parameters is what are being trained, right? These are the, the parameters N is what after training in machine learning, of course, you have a training process. And those are the parameters which are which you're trying to figure out uh, after training. Okay. So it doesn't depend on the input and the output. The output could be W2 by W2 by uh, K. But uh, we, these are not the parameters that we're looking for. Basically, the parameters are the K, are the filters in between. Okay. So the the in so who determines the number of parameters? 
Does the input, does the size of the data set determine the, uh, the, the number of parameters or does the architect of the, of the algorithm? Uh, the architect. The architect, right? So if, if you are the architect, you would decide uh, how many filters to use and how what would be the size of the filters. D of course is, is determined on the input, but D is mostly fixed. It's simply the depth which is three for a colored, for a colored image. So basically in neural networks, uh, this is uh, the number of parameters as you can see is typically if, you, if, it's, a, if it's a CNN, there will be KF squared D. What about linear regression? Now, do people remember what linear regression was? Right? In linear regression, you had a bunch of points and you're not trying to classify it. You're simply trying to find a, a best fit, a linear fit which would go through all the points, right? I guess so. And we did that by gradient descent, if I remember correctly. Yes, so you did that by gradient descent, but what is the number, is it, uh, is the number of parameters fixed? in the solution or is does it grow dip based on the data set and what are the number what are the parameters in this the number of points uh, no number of parameters what you're trying to train the number of points are the data set okay and the number of parameters are what you're trying to train okay what you're trying to determine so at the end of a training exercise the parameters are fine-tuned, okay? You figure out exactly what the optimal parameters are. So in a, in a linear regression- So um, parameters are the errors between the best fit and the points? The I parameters think. are the errors. At the end of it, are is that what you're trying to determine in, what are you trying to determine in the linear regression? A single output? Yeah. So. Uh, and this, we basically trying to determine the the equation of the line, right? And the equation of the line is given by what? Y is equal to mx plus c, right? That's what we've learned in calculus. So if you're trying to, and so in in this case where you have a bunch of points, bunch of x and y values given to you already, so you have x and why given to you, uh, what you're trying to do is you basically, you're trying to find the best fit. So you, you may have X1 here, Y1 here, X2, Y2. This would be all your training data. And after you've done the fitting, after you find what is the optimal line which fits through all of this, you will have determined what, uh, which, which parameters would you have determined? So the gradient. Exactly, and the gradient is given by M. And what else? That what parameters determine the 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 line, an equation of a line? The points. Well, the intercept. Uh, intercept, right? So C is the intercept. So if the line was going like this, C would be the intercept, and M would be the slope of the line, right? So how many parameters are there in linear regression? n is equal to two, very good. And those are basically m and c, okay? So is this parametric or non-parametric? Non-parametric. Parametric, right? Because the number of parameters is fixed. It's simply the equation of the line, which is what we're trying to determine. And it doesn't depend on the input size. So if you had, you know, if you had 100 pairs of points that you're trying to fit, or you had a thousand, the the number of parameters would still be m and c okay i hope that is clear so this is also a parametric example uh, decision trees now we looked at decision trees now what do you how would you cons class what would you call the parameters in the decision trees it's not very clear but um, does it, does the decision tree does it is it based, does it um, change based on the size of the data set? Sir, can you say the Gini index? Sorry? The Gini index. Yeah. Can that be the parameter? 
will that be the parameter so uh, if you think about uh, if you think about um, a decision tree you start with um, you know a, a root and then you're looking at branches now basically what's happening is that uh, the more complex your data set is will your uh, decision tree become more and more complex if you had a thousand different types of uh, information would that um, um, would that change would, or, or would your uh, basic decision tree would remain you know maybe a two level or three level or would that change as the data set becomes more and more complex it will change it will definitely be changed it would definitely change yes so that is the right answer so as the the data set becomes more and more complex the decision tree would become more and more complex okay as life becomes it would have more branches um, and so uh, so the decision tree if you think about it you can think that the number the parameters are actually the number of branches and the number of uh, you know the depth of the tree and the width of the tree and the number of branches in the tree okay so that those can be considered as parameters in the decision tree so now uh, having defined the parameters would that be parametric or non parametric is it is it fixed or is it growing with the data set uh, non parametric non -parametric. It, would, it would be non parametric so it would definitely be non parametric over here and number of parameters is hard to quantify it, but it would you can see that as the complexity of the data set grows uh, the decision tree can can grow to accommodate complex decision okay complex data sets uh, next the knn algorithm that we just studied so this is a tricky one now would you consider it as parametric or non parametric and so non parametric it's not generalized so it's it must why, be non parametric why non parametric why well, firstly Sir? it's not generalized for any any number of data set that we have yeah so so in a sense we are not specifying pre specifying uh, for example the value of k right so if uh, if you have um, a large so if um, if if you go for a mark for example we we saw that earlier that as um, you go through the analysis if you find out that the k is equal to 9 or 90 is better so uh, perhaps the algorithm can be considered as non parametric okay but it, it's a little tricky as to how you define this, but generally KNN is considered to be a non-parametric al algorithm, okay? So you have an idea of what parametric and non-parametric models are. Um, and I'm going to now look at, let me see how much time there is. Um, I'm going to look at a couple of, a uh, few algorithms very briefly. Uh, one of them is logistic regression, um, support, uh, vector machines and k-means clustering. And uh, let's see how far we can get with these. But the first one that I'm going to consider is going to be a parametric uh, model example, okay? Now, logistic regression is fairly straightforward. Uh, when, you look, when, you listen, when you hear the word regression, does this imply that it's a classification algorithm or not? Remember when we looked at linear regression, was that classification or, or non-classification? Classification teacher said. Sorry? Classification teacher said. Uh, well, when you're trying to fit a, a linear regression, if you have number of points, are you trying to really classify them or are you simply trying to say, well, I want to find what line <laughs> gets. You're simply doing a prediction, right? So uh, linear regression is non-classification, all right? It's non-classification. So generally regression, when you hear the word regression, it simply means uh, non-classification. For example, if it's a polynomial regression, so if you're trying to fit uh, not a linear line, but you're trying to fit, um, let's say a quadratic line and you have these points over here, then you could fit 
uh, you know, a second order polynomial over here. And that would again be a prediction. You're trying to predict whether if it's a, if it's a new point over here, uh, what would be the, given the uh, value of X, what would be the uh, predicted value of Y, okay? But logistic regression is a little different. Uh, it carries the word regression, but it's actually a classification algorithm, okay? And why is it a classification algorithm? Uh, we'll try to understand why it's called a regression. So basically now um, think of the earlier problem, which was in two dimensions. We had two um, features, X1 and X2, and we were simply trying to find uh, a line between these two which would classify these two, okay? And we saw that being done in ANN, we saw that being done uh, in, in different algorithms. Um, now here, we're we going to first, in order to be able to understand um, logistic regression, but I'm going to first simplify the problem. And I'm going to say that, let's just forget about X2, okay? I'm going to only look at one feature, X1, okay? So in other words, I'm going to map this into one dimension. Okay, so you can see that this triangle has come here, this triangle has come here, and so on. So we've, we've mapped this onto one dimension. And when you map this onto one dimension, you can see that uh, there is some overlap. Okay, so is it you, it, in two dimensions, it was, was it linearly separable in 2D? Was it linearly separable here? In this case? Yes, sir. Yeah, you could find uh, a plane which could actually go through this, right? But when you mapped it onto 1D, you've gone from uh, 2D to 1D. Unfortunately, is this now linearly separable? No, sir. So it's no longer linearly separable, all right? Um, now, and, and I'm doing this to be able to explain what logistic regression is. So the first thing that I'm, I've done is taken a look at an example with only one feature. And in this feature, now I'm going to say that what's the simplest way of being able to classify this? Okay, if you, for example, I want to say, what is the probability that this is a triangle? It's either a zero or a one. So where would you draw the boundary? Okay, if let's say this is the decision boundary, then you'd probably draw it somewhere over here, right? And you can see that this is an outlier, this is an outlier. Most of the triangles are on this side, most of the rectangles are on this side, okay? So um, the, the simplest way to be assigned probabilities would be that we could say, well, let's use a step function and anything that is less than X naught is going to be classified as a, as a rectangle. And any, um, any uh, sample which, whose X value is greater than X naught is going to be classified as a triangle, okay? So this would be the simplest way of doing it and this would use a step function. Okay. However, um, whenever you're doing some of these, uh, solving these problems, ultimately you are trying to minimize the error. So we're going to look at the error and then we're going to have a loss function. Okay. And the loss function will then have to be minimized, right? And when you're trying to minimize the loss function, what technique have we learned so far? How gradient do we minimize? Gradient descent. Very good. So. Does gradient descent work well with step functions? Do you remember that? No, because it's not differentiable. Exactly. So if you recall the back propagation algorithm, instead of using the gradient descent, uh, instead of using the step function over here, what did we use? Sigmoid. Sigmoid. We use a sigmoid, right? Why? Because the sigmoid has a nice property that uh, if you differentiate it, you get a differentiable. Okay. So here again. Uh, we're going to use the uh, the same sigmoid function. Uh, the sigmoid um, was this, and uh, it was slightly uh, this the, the this function, the logistic function, is a generalized version of the sigmoid function, and you can see why it's generalized. Uh, the sigmoid was always centered at x is equal to zero, and it always had um, you know a specific curve value, okay? It had a specific uh, shape. Now, what we're doing here is we're generalizing this and we're calling it a logistic function. And now instead of just having X over here, we now have other parameters, okay? 
And what we're trying to do is we're trying to fit this. Uh, and that's why it's called a regression because we're going to try to fit the optimal, sig uh, optimal logistic function. So we could look at different logistic functions. Basically, we could look at something which is going over here. We could have something which is like this, okay? Something which is like this. All of these are, are logistic functions. But the question is which one has the minimum error, okay? So let's take a first, first take a look at the logistic function. So if you try to plot this, um, what do you think is the value of this? Where do you think it becomes midway? If you think about the parameters, now, and now the question is, is this parametric model or non-parametric model? You're trying to fit a sigmoid, okay? And how many parameters does a sigmoid have? How many unknowns that we're trying to optimize? So, so, two, two, I guess. CNX. so we had y is equal to mx plus c here. The, these are the two parameters. Here we have the two parameters are k and x naught. And x naught, exactly. x is, of course, a variable. So basically, we're trying to find what k and x naught are. And um, if you notice, if when x is equal to x naught, what will this become? 1 plus e to the power minus k times 0, right? One yeah, will, sorry, sir. One will be this will become one upon two, which will become half, right? Oh, now, basically, sorry. what this function is trying to do is it's trying to predict the probability that it's either a triangle or not triangle. Okay, so um, you can see from this diagram that what should be the value over here? What should be the value of x over here, where it hits exactly fifty percent? This should be x naught. Is that clear? Because when x is x naught, then the, the value of s of x, which is over here, becomes 0 0.5, as I've shown over here. Okay, e to the power of 0 becomes 1, 1 upon 2 becomes 0 0.5. Now, what about this? You can see that both of these can be considered as, as logistic functions. Notice that this one is a little sharper. Okay, and this one has a different uh, slope. So what do you think, what is determining the slope? Well, clearly one of the parameters is, det is determining the location. Okay, is determining the location of this. The gradient uh, the, of the curve at the point mm -hmm. x naught. Yes, so k, the slope will be determined by k. All right, so basically what we're saying is, we're going to, when we're fitting this, uh, we, we're going to find the best values of um, k and x naught. And the x naught over here, as I've already had shown you, will determine the point which is optimally di differentiating these two points, the triangles and the rectangles. And the sig and the slope will determine what is the probability. So if we say, look, we look at this triangle and we try to determine uh, if we have a point over here, and we're trying to determine what is the probability that it is a triangle or a rectangle, we'd simply look at the value over here, and this would tell us, oops, this would tell us over here, what is the probability that it is a triangle, okay? So this looks something like a 0.8, okay? So this particular triangle has an 80%, this particular item, which has an X value given over here, let's say X1, it has an 80% probability of being a triangle. Okay, so um, so that's basically what the logistic regression is doing, is essentially fitting a sigmoid function or a logistic function uh, in your binary classification instead of a simple um, step function. Okay, and, and why is, it, is this being used? Simply because it's much easier to fit this and to use gradient descent to be able to uh, get the optimal values of k and x naught. Okay, these are the values that we're going to find using the gradient descent algorithm. Okay. So, um, and, and now you can also see why it's called a regression because essentially we're trying to fit, uh, if we had tried to fit a linear regression, we would probably fit something like this. Okay. But here, what we're trying to do is fit 
a sigmoid or logistic, which is a S shaped. And you're trying to fit this as best as possible through these points. Okay. So that was a little bit about logistic uh, regression. And this is also one of the very popular ways of doing classification. Okay. So now we've also seen KNN. We've seen uh, logistic regression. Of course, we've seen ANN as well. All of these techniques can be used to do classifications. Um, we have some time left, so let's take a quick look at some of the other algorithms. Um, support vector machines, it's a, it's a big name, but it's also uh, technically it's a little complex, but I'm not going to go into the, into the math of it. I'm just going to try to explain to you what is the concept be behind support vector machines. Again, it's not very really difficult, the basic concept. So let's say again, we have the example of triangles and rectangles. And what we're trying to do is now find the best uh, separator. Now this could be a hyperplane uh, if it's in multiple dimensions or it could be a single line if it's just in two dimensions. So in this case, it's just two dimensions. There are only two features over here, X1 and X2. And in this case, now my question to you is, which one of these would, would you want to use? L1, L2, or L3? Now remember- um, Sir, L1, L1 better. L1 seems to be better, right? Why? Because it seems to be, even, even though all three of them will uh, do a great job at differentiating this particular sample of data points. However, they would, uh, one of them would probably, this would probably generalize better and this would probably not generalize. So if you had another triangle over here, the L2 would actually misclassify it, okay? But L1 would classify it correctly. If you had a triangle over, if you had a rectangle over here, L3 would misclassify it, but L1 would still be able to classify it correctly. So L1 seems to generalize better, all right? Better. Now the question is, uh, based on your observation, um, you were able to look at that, but if you're trying to use a mathematical operation, how would we do that? How could you actually figure out that L1 is the best as compared to L2 and L3? Can you use some mathematical operation? So you, yeah. You would want to find the line that is farthest away from uh, each uh, point. Like on the right side, it should be an equal distance away from the right triangles. And on the right. left side, an equal distance from the rectangles. Okay, excellent. So what you're suggesting is that we, what we could do is now, are you suggest we, we could look at the measurement, the, the distance to each one of these points, okay? And we could say, well, which line actually has the best maximum, error, maximum distance, okay? And you look at the distances. Again, it would have to be uh, the actual distance from the line. So we'd probably take a, a rectangle line and, and look at the shortest distance to this. So we look at, for here, we look at the shortest distance. So um, this is sort of like the regression equation, that the linear regression, where we're simply trying to find the best fit, okay, which, which will go through all of these lines. So that's uh, one of the techniques. However, SVM does it slightly differently, okay? What it says is, uh, I'm not going to look at all of these uh, sample points, okay? I'm not going to look at all of these. I'm only going to look at the ones which are closest to me, okay? So I'm going to, I'm going to call the points, the, uh, the points which are closest to me. So let's say this is the line we're trying to figure out. So which are the triangles which are closest? It's going to be this point and this, okay? And the, re the rectangles, these two seem to be closest. I'm going to forget about the rest of them, okay? And I'm going to call these support vectors. Okay, why are they called vectors? Well, because you can see that each one of them will have X1 and X2 values, okay? And if it's in multiple dimensions, it could have uh, a large number of uh, features which correspond to it. So these will be called support vectors and these will be defined as the data points which are on the margins, okay, of your line. Now, once you've determined these, these margin points, and in fact, you determine the one that is the closest. So even this is, is going to be neglected because you can see this is the closest, okay, and so on. And then what you're going to determine is um, 
you got to determine the margins to that particular support vector. So you can see that in this particular case, the margin to, um, and, and you, okay, so one more thing. You're going to draw parallel lines. So this is your main line. You're going to draw parallel lines and you're going to move them apart. Okay, so you're going to slowly move them further and further away, all right? And these are going to be parallel lines. Eventually, they're going to touch one of the support vectors. Okay, so this one is going to touch this guy. Uh, this one is going to touch this guy. Okay, and this one, the the line will, the primary line will be considered to be mid uh, mid uh, the midpoint between these two. Okay, so this will be the distance to one of the binary class uh, categories, and this will be the distance to the other category. Okay, one and two, both of them will be equal. So this will be uh, called, let's say, D1 over here in this case. And this will be called the margin. And this will be the distance to the, uh, to the nearest support vectors. OK, so far, so good. So now the basic idea is that you want to select the line which has the largest margin. OK, so if you think about these two, which one would have the largest margin? Would L1 have the largest, larger margin or L2? So L1 seems to have. Yeah, so L1 would probably because you would draw parallel lines. And if you look at L1, if I can draw this right, it would have a margin this much. Okay, this is very similar to the line before. And if you looked at L2, then the margin over here is a little thinner. Okay. It's hitting, it's hitting the support vectors very quickly. So the margin over here seems to be, if this is D2 and this is D1, uh, I can safely say, uh, despite my bad drawing, that D1 seems to be better than D2, okay? And here's a better drawing. So here is D2. You can see that it is the, the D2 margin is much smaller and the earlier D1 had a larger margin, okay? So this is basically how you would determine which one is better. So you basically play around with a large number of lines and you would have a complex algorithm which would eventually, through an iterative method, again, probably using gradient descent, it would, it would be able to determine which is the best one, okay? So here again, this is also from your book. Uh, it shows you that there are various lines and you can choose, you eventually the SVM will find the separator, which is which has the largest margin. Okay. So the difference between the margin and the main line is basically your error. Yes. So uh, it's so, won't so be called an error here. The error. Uh, yeah, you you won't call it an error. The reason why it's not an error, yeah, it's called a margin because uh, an error would be where you misclassifying. Now, in all of these cases, are the is it are is the examples of Linearly separable or non-linearly separable uh, samples? They're linearly separable. These are all linearly separable. So in, in other words, there is no error. In all of these lines are actually 100% correctly classifying, but their margin is different. In some cases, the margin is better. In other cases, the margin is worse, is small or large. So basically you're going to select the, the boundary or the plane as you might call them. Okay, so this is a hyperplane. So my, question was, my question was, what is the basic criteria that you're, on which you're deciding if the margin is best or margin is not good enough? So repeat your question. You're saying that, uh, is this good, good enough criteria to use the margin? Is that what you're saying? No, sir. I'm saying that you say that the margin is better better. Okay. Yeah, that's a good that, that's a good question. So, how will we actually determine the margin? So, that is something I haven't explained, and that is that goes into the mathematics. Okay, so there will be complex mathematical equations which I'm not going into, but I'm just trying to show you from a geometric point of view as to what the mathematical equations will do. Okay, they will try to determine the margin. Okay, and they will select a, a plane, a hyperplane, or a line in two dimensions, which has the largest margin. Is that clear? But I'm not telling you how it's being done. But you can see it visually what the end result will be. 
Okay, because if I had to do that, I would need an entire lecture and you don't want a 29th lecture, I think, in this course. Okay, right. So basically, this is what SVMs do, support vector machines. You understand what a support vector is now, and it basically tries to find a hyperplane which maximizes margin. But there is a, a, a twist to this. Now, the question is, um, what happens if it's not linearly separable? then your margin is actually your error, right? As you were saying, uh, trying, to max, trying to maximize your error or minimize your error. So the question is that what if um, it is not linearly separable? So here's an example where a triangle is right in the middle of the rectangles. And here are some rectangles which are right outside on the other side of the triangles. So now we're stuck. So what could we do now with SVMs? So any thought if going along the concept of an SVM and also keeping to in mind that I did something in, um, initially uh, when I spoke about um, SVMs, I, um, I went from a two dimension to one dimension, right? And when I went from one, two dimension, which was linearly separable to one dimension, it became non-linearly separable. So does that give you a hint as to what we could do? Suppose that this is what your data was. It was in one dimension, it wasn't linearly separable. Can you get an idea as to what we could do to make it linearly separable? We went in this direction, right? Can we go in the opposite direction? Can so, we make it 3D? Yes, so what we could do is we could reverse this. So suppose this is what your data was and you're trying to make it linearly separable. What you could do is find a mapping function which takes it to a higher dimension, okay? So that's what SVM does when it is faced with the issue of what if it is not linearly separable. So in this case, can you think of, uh, this already in two dimensions, right? X1 and X2. So what would be a higher dimension? Three D We could make it into 3D, right? So we could make uh, X3 as a new feature, and we could come up with a mapping function between the 2D to 3D, which could perhaps separate it. Now, can you think of a mapping function? Let's say that all the triangles were in the middle and all the rectangles were around the sides. Can you think of a mapping function that can separate this and make it linearly separable? Let's say this is the center point, is X1 and X2. Can you think of a mapping function that can make it se linearly separable? You want so to can make, you map it to the distance from the center? So like the greater the distance is from the center, uh, yes, increases by exactly. that. And if you remember, this is what was being done in, um, when we looked at the TensorFlow playground, I remember we, we took X1 squared and X2 squared. So we mapped it to a higher dimension. And there we saw that it was very easily linearly separable. Okay, with two neurons, uh, we couldn't do that with with x1 and x2, but when we did x1 squared and x2 squared, you were able to immediately use these two neurons to separate them. Okay. Um, in fact, let's see if you can, yeah, you don't even need two neurons. You, all you need is a single neuron and you can separate it simply because you've got, you've mapped it to a higher dimension. Okay. So this is what the SVM does, and this is called a kernel trick. Okay. There's a fancy name again, but it simply means kernel is, is some. Uh, equation, some al some equation mapping function. And in this case, the mapping function is simply um, x squared plus y squared, okay? And you can see that if these are the points, if these are your inner points, okay? And these are all your outer points. And right now, these are not linearly separable in the x1 and x2, okay? So this is, let's say, x, x, and this is y. And now what they've done is, 
they've mapped it, mapped this is the X and this is the Y. Now we've got Z is the third dimension. And now all of a sudden you can see that the ones that were closer to the center are now being mapped uh, at the, uh, are, are lower in Z value. And this is the, the plane that I've drawn over here. And this is a, a, a linear separator. Uh, this is a hyperplane, you might call it. Hyperplane, or actually uh, in this case, it's just a normal 3D plane. And it's separating all the points which are further away to a larger value of Z. So if you look at the value of Z over here, it's now become linearly separable, okay? But it requires uh, computation. It requires you to figure out what the kernel value is. It's not always completely obvious. This is an example from the book again. It shows you a similar example, except that it's, uh, yeah, it's again very similar. It's found uh, a plane which can separate uh, these in the, Z, in the Z dimension. Okay. So um, I think the time is up over as well. So that will bring us to the end of this course. Um, and there was another thing which I'll just show this to you real quickly. This is another algorithm which is called k-means and this is a clustering algorithm. And without going into the detail that this, this is very useful when you're trying to do k-means clustering. And again, this is similar to the KNN in that you have a number k uh, and you start doing iterations and you start with uh, k, for example, k is equal to four, one, two, three, four, five, sorry. And the question is, can you separate these out? And what you do is you keep doing an iterative algorithm and eventually it can separate it out, okay? Without going into the details, you can look this up. But here you can see that initially the cluster centers are all in the wrong places. They're not really properly, uh, you know, you can see that all of these have been initially randomly chosen as the cluster centers. And you're trying to figure out the distances to the cluster centers from all the data points. And then as you go through an iterative algorithm, it eventually converges and it finds uh, that these are, the, these, these are the five clusters. Okay. This is a called K-means algorithm. Okay. So anyway, let me stop over here. Um, and um, I just want you to review this particular slide when you uh, think about the entire course itself, because this slide, which was I think shown in one of the earlier lectures, it gives a very good overview of all, of all the algorithms that we've studied. You know, we've gone from uh, MDP and search games where the uh, representation, the states were represented atom atomically. And then we looked at the factored representation and all of machine learning is actually a factored representation where basically a state consists of a vector of attributes. You know, all those parameters that we talked about and CNN and so on, those are essentially your factored representation of your entire state. And a structured representation was done in cases, for example, in first order logic and, uh, in, and in knowledge based learning. Okay. And in NLP as well, you had a structured representation. But this is a good slide to end the course in, I think. <laughs>